The Vienna of 1913, capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is likened to a cultural soup that attracted those with ambition from far across the empire, an empire which then exceeded a population of 50 million and consisting of 15 nations. The emperor, Franz Joseph, provided over all from the Hofburg's palace. His heir, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Belvedere Palace, eagerly awaited his throne. His assassination in 1914 would ignite World War I. The intellectual community was small. It was a city where everyone knew one another, a city of two million where less than 50% were native-born, a quarter of its population from Bohemia and Moravia, and Czech spoken alongside German was the norm. It was a city that spoke countless languages and where army officials were required to issue orders in at least 12 different mother tongues. The state was losing control and one could easily hide away unchallenged. All was perfect for the political dissident and or others found to be on the run from someone or something. In 1913, almost 1,500 Viennese committed suicide in desperation to escape the vast crawling slums of the time. As history now informs us, we know that the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin arrived in Vienna for one month during the year 1913. He was there alongside Leon Trotsky and Nikolai Bukharin to author the political work Marxism and the National Question. Stalin and Trotsky were both in political exile, fleeing Tsarist Russia. The Russian revolutionary, Leon Trotsky, had at this point founded the ideological newspaper Pravda. He lived in the city between the years 1907 and 1914. A young metal worker, Josip Bros, was always found to be here, residing amongst the city's quarters. He was later drafted into the Austro-Hungarian army. We know him today as the Yugoslav leader, Marshal Tito. Sigmund Freud was respected and well-established in Bogaz, fleeing persecution. He left Vienna in 1938 as Austria became annexed by the Nazis. The leader of which, Adolf Hitler, was also in Vienna during 1913 and pursuing the dreams of a young artist in wishing to join the Vienna Academy of Art. At the end of World War I, 1918 witnessed the Austro-Hungarian Empire crumble. Stalin, Hitler, Trotsky and Tito would all soon rise to power. Their beliefs and ideologies would lead to the killing of untold millions. There is no historical account that states that Hitler met Trotsky, or if Stalin knew Tito, or if Freud knew any of them at all, Maybe they never did, but let's just imagine, for a moment, that they did. What on earth would they have found the time to talk about? Tito and the Snail, from the e-book, One Lump or Two, Mr Hitler, by J.R.P. Taylor. Tito was in a refreshing mood one particular following yet unknown day Freud had penned. It appears that Freud thought admirably of him at the time and referred to him in one later paragraph of his journal as the storyteller. The encounter that day had been summed up in fine reflective detail and clearly demonstrated the impression made on the psychoanalysis's probing mind. The men had joked together, Freud asking, are you too prepared to give up your life as a revolutionary as Starling and Trotsky declare? I've no fear of death, replied Tito. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Tito had told Freud a story. They'd been alone together awaiting the arrival of the other three. Unusually and without reason for expanded, they were noted to arrive quite later than usual. Passing time by, the story unfolded. I was outside the Daimler factory a few weeks back, Tito had started. I was talking to the men about Karl Marx. General chit-chat and nothing special, he informed. Just trying to recruit for the trade union. You know, stuff like that, the norm. Having been asked about Marx by a fellow worker, one he did not know, he had explained that Marx had been born in Prussia on the 5th of May 1918 in Trier, Buchengausse 664, today a small town found on the border of western Germany. He studied at the University of Bonn but had lived in Manchester with his good friend Frederick Engels. As journalists, writing on the mills of England's industrial revolution and the desperate plight of the workers now enslaved there. Within many notable ideas of the time, history, philosophy, political theory and economics, his work, The Manifest with the Communist Party, 1848, was the better known. It was the first party political manifesto ever written, Tito had told the interested worker. 
I was doing all the usual speak before discussing the key concepts of surplus value, class struggle, exploitation and materialism when he suddenly interrupted me, stopped me dead in my tracks in fact, as he then just randomly started to tell me a story. Tito explained to Freud. He just gave me his entire life story. It went on forever. To say an hour is an under an exaggeration, Siegmund, I must tell you. The man's story had begun on one Christmas Eve. Tito, quite unsure which Christmas Eve the worker was referring to, explained that it had been recently, past few years, but the lack of fine detail did not impact on the story. Freud had listened patiently to Tito's recollections and was, according to his journal, quite bored and frustrated with the slow pace of delivery at many points. It was all quite surreal, Tito imparted. I kept interrupting him and continually tried to get his focus back towards me and the revolution, the words of Karl Marx. But he just wasn't interested. He just rambled on and on and on. It seemed like the story had already gone on forever before Tito had even managed to begin the story itself, finally getting down to explain that the man had been at home with his family. The man had had a comfortable home and was, by all accounts, a good life. He had been an engineer. He and family had lived in the affluent suburb of Esterhazy Park and had all the modern trappings and worldly goods beyond others of the time. Silver candlesticks, gas, lighting and a grand piano, among many other nice things. Tito continued to explain. They had just finished Christmas dinner. He had put his three children to bed at eight and was sat in an armchair beside the fire his wife and he reading whilst listening to the calming tick-tock of his grandfather's old, inherited grandfather clock. Upon finishing this sentence, Tito then randomly started to explain that there was plenty of wood in the house for Christmas, even telling Freud how many logs were placed beside the fire. Seven, he had recalled the man telling him. Frustrated with the over and unnecessarily continued great depth and detail of the story, we see that Freud had become quite bombastic with Tito. After one hour, he said, Am I ever going to hear this blasted story, or are you just going to continually waffle on about it? To which Tito had replied, If the finer detail was not important, I wouldn't be telling you all about it, would I? Freud despaired of it, and Tito continued plodding over his words just as before, quite unaffected by his friend's apparent boredom and ever-increasing lack of disinterest. And... I am certain that my reader here, with me now, is too equally frustrated by such unnecessary overuse of text, but I assure you, it does have important significance. The story finally began. There was a knock on the door. It was on exactly the stroke of midnight. The clock had just announced to the second the arrival of Christmas Day. It was a cold, frosty night, but they had eaten well and with the warm glow of the firelight flickering out across the room, did not feel cold at all. He thanked his lucky stars for his fortunate life as he walked to answer. Who could it be at such a late hour, he thought. It was not a night that one wanted at all to be without warmth, sleeping on the streets amongst the many homeless peasants of Vienna's slums. It must be the poor, he concluded. They've come to ask for food again, and they shall eat, he decided. He was a good honourable man, and that was important to note, insisted Tito. As he had risen from the comfort of his armchair, he had put down his book, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, a work that many in middle-class circles had read since first published in 1843. He was utterly bewildered by Ebenezer Scrooge's absolute meanness and lack of humanity to those of lesser social strata placed unkindly below him. Upon opening the door, he found no one. He looked round about, left to right and up and down. He found only a snail on the doormat to his feet. Without thinking, he gave the snail a swift, though gentle kick with the tip of his slipper, and off into the night's air it flew, far away out of sight. I'm a farmer's boy, you know, said Tito, from a peasant family in Croatia, Komaravec, actually. I was born in 1892. My father was an alcoholic. He borrowed so much money from the banks that he used to send me to negotiate with his creditors so they wouldn't take our land. I think he thought that they would take pity on me as a child and... And this has got what to do with the story, asked Freud. Nothing really, replied Tito. Only to say that I've had a really hard life and thought 
You might show some interest in my own story first. The bankers used to ridicule and mock me. I always wanted to be so much more than I am today. When I was a child, I dreamed of being a waiter or a tailor, running away to the USA, or something grand like that. Then why didn't you? asked Freud. Life is what you make of it, you know. Actually, I don't agree with you on that point, Siegmund. My father spent the family's travel money on booze, broke our hearts at the time, promised us a new life overseas, and then drank our hopes and dreams into oblivion. Mother particularly. She was a good hard-working farmer's wife, but, well, fate had its way, I guess. The door sprung open, and in walked the three gentlemen, with a spring in the heel as expected, but somewhat late. Thank God, cried Freud. Forget the revolution today. Just save me from the story first, please, gentlemen. Though after Freud had said this, he did chuckle somewhat. He wasn't really desperate, but just kind of desperate, I think. Well, don't let us interrupt you, Trotsky said. And after some friendly banter, both Hitler and Stalin, too, seemed keen to know what the story was all about. Just as Freud started to utter the sentence, I fear we will never find out, sirs. The snail got kicked and that was it so far. Tito seized the moment to recap on the entire event from the beginning to thus far. In his journal, Freud notes that this is the period of his life in which he felt had prompted his first hair loss, noting, for a man of such charisma and personality, he can at times be utterly boring. Women seem to flock to him. He's informed me of a string of young fillies, and his reputation for virility and affairs is well established amongst the coffee houses. What on earth do they see in him? I just wanted to pull my own hair out by the roots. At the end of it all, he concluded. The story, again after much delay, now regained direction and pace. Tito explained that after the man had kicked the snail, everything had gone downhill from there. As he'd gone to answer the door, his wife had fallen asleep with her book, knocking over a candle in the process. The chair had ignited, and after failed attempts to douse the flames, having first awoken the children, his home had been razed to the ground by fire. That's awful, said Trotsky. I know, replied Tito, adding, but it all gets much worse, I assure you. Tito then explained that he had been born the seventh of fourteen siblings, and that he was lucky to reach the age he is today, that being twenty-one years old. Only six of his siblings had lived into adulthood, and then equally randomly he started talking about how A Christmas Tale had at first been published by Chapman and Hall of London in 1843. This time it was Stalin who managed to get Tito to return and re-engage with the story. So he kicked the snail, having answered the door, thinking it was the poor, and then the house burns down, and what? Tito accordingly continued the story at Stalin's request. After Christmas the following year, they'd found themselves in the poorhouse. The man had gone from riches to rags within an instant, but they weren't yet aware of it. It seemed that every month thereafter a new horror would befall him. His life was now in ruins, a complete and total disaster. So what happened next, then? Stalin asked. The relationship between the two was an uneasy alliance, but overall Stalin liked young Tito and would often refer to him as a good man. He was most interested in hearing more. Following the fire, the house next door had caught fire, it too being gutted along with several other adjoining apartments and tenements. The engineer had been forced to sell his business to settle compensation claims. Left without home or company, the family had then taken up temporary rented accommodation. Though he had secured work in a local factory for himself and was in the process of obtaining a loan to start afresh, it would be a smaller, more modest affair. But in remaining creditworthy, he realised that he would soon be back on his feet again. Do you know why I wanted to be a tailor or even a waiter when I was a child? Tito asked the group. Hitler and Trotsky were by now laughing their heads off at the random remark yet again and in witnessing Freud's utter despair with him, made the laughter even greater. And of course, Stalin couldn't see what was funny at all, as cold as ever, impatiently waiting on the next instalment of the story. What the? bellowed Stalin, as Tito had then explained that he'd always wanted to wear nice clothes. It appeared to him that waiters of the day also had the best cut cloth. If he couldn't be a waiter, then as a tailor, he would at least then learn how to make his own bespoke fits instead. And that was the reason. Eventually calm returns, and so too does the story. 
Later, during January, having borrowed cash up to the hilt, he lost his job. And in losing his job, not only could he not pay his rent, but also his children's school fees. The bank foreclosed on his loans, and now, quite unworthy of credit, he relied on the generosity of friends. So, you would think that things couldn't get any worse, wouldn't you? Tito said. But I assure you they did. Hitler recapped. So, in December, after he had kicked the snail, his house burnt down. And then in January, he lost his company to bankruptcy, followed by homelessness. In February, is that correct? He asked. Not quite that bad yet, stated Tito. His best friend became a guarantor for the family's rent. So, jobless, yes, but homeless, no, Tito concluded. Thank God for that, added Freud. It's a terrible story. I do hope you find some happiness at the end of it, for I fear you will upset my delicate sensitivities if I hear much more of this sorrow and sufferings. You see, capitalism is the enemy of us all. We are all victims of a brutal system, Tito said, and again returning to his random thought and output. That's why I was trying to tell this man of the words of Marx the day we met. The system plays us all off against each other. We are not enemies, and it's all too simplistic to say that the bourgeoisie are our enemy. They can suffer terribly too. Absolutely, interrupted Trotsky. After all, had he not gone to the door to feed the poor, none of this would have happened. And as Trotsky then finished speaking, Stalin concluded, I'm not so convinced that it was a misguided attempt to help others less fortunate that led to this unfortunate set of circumstance. Personally, I think the snail had something to do with it. Are you suggesting that the snail possessed evil, Stalin? asked Freud. Do you not think it possible, Freud? He was problem-free until he kicked it. Keep your friendly snails close and your enemy snails even closer. That's what I would have suggested to him. The men soon realised that this was one of Stalin's poor attempts at humour, though they all laughed out of acknowledged politeness. I used to have a beautifully cut suit once upon a time, before I arrived in Vienna. That was, I bought it in Prague, Tito rumbled. I was forced out of desperation to bed down for the night in a cattle shed, woke up the next day to find a cow had eaten it. Well, most of it, at any rate. Tito, seriously, can't you just stay focused for a moment? What happened next? We're in March now, yes? Trotsky demanded to know. He by now was frustrated as Freud with this endless, tiring story which appeared absent of the necessary and much-needed conclusion. Freud noticed that only Hitler and Stalin remained patient with Tito's offering and put this down to the fact that they had never showed any interest in anybody else but themselves previously, so why would they change today? Though observed that they too were changing. Stalin wanted to know everything and Hitler, by now, was doodling with charcoal on a linen placemat. Actually, gentlemen, I owe all that I know today, my entire education, that is, to the Communist Party, Tito said before eventually getting around to March. March had been appalling too. The man, having now borrowed extensively from the friend who had become the willing guarantor of the family's rent, turned out to be not so much of a friend. After all, he had taken liberties with his wife. You mean he was, shall we politely say, taking personal liberties of the flesh in romantic ways with his wife's friend, inquired a confused Stalin. That's exactly what I'm saying, Tito replied. And in April, he had not only moved into the apartment with her, but was now suing his former friend for the sums outstanding. Freud, sickened to the core by this latest revelation, demanded to know what happened next. Tito continued to elaborate. Well, of course, he couldn't pay it back, Freud. The borrowed money, that is. And in May, he found himself incarcerated in a debtor's prison. The room fell silent as not one of the Sugarlump Club could find any words of further expression that could possibly be used to express their utter shock. Tito, keen to break the silence and lift the heavy, depressing atmosphere, then continued. Unsurprisingly, nothing to do with the story, but an exchange of dialogue with young Hitler sat opposite concerning the men's joint love and appreciation of dogs. Hunting, fishing and horse riding, that's the life I hope for, Adolf. Walking with my dogs in the countryside, and most of all, I'd like to do this whilst living on an island. Tito informed. Yes, dogs. It's the German shepherd breed for me on that score. Not so keen on the hunting, though. Trying to reduce my meat intake. Not so good for the body these days, Hitler replied. I'm more of a mountains man, personally. But I agree, living on an island does appeal to the senses somewhat. 
Stalin and Trotsky then shouted out in perfect unison, June! What happened in June, man? For Christ's sake, Joseph Bross! Interrupting and using Tito's formal birth name as a means of asserting some greater authority over him as a teacher would assert over one's pupil. I was trying to avoid June, gentlemen. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Obviously, the new love affair didn't work out. Now, could it? I mean, you can't build happiness on someone else's unhappiness, can you? It haunted the new relationship. The debtor's prison, that is. Tito continued. So he left her, after just a handful of weeks, and she, the ex, that is, well, took to the oldest profession in the world, sadly. It was Freud who interrupted the story's flow this time, saying, It's a symptom of arrested development. It signals that the individual is quite unable to integrate inner conflicts. It's all about low self-esteem, her overall view of life's value, and, of course, a good dose of poor self-image. If I were to treat such a wretched woman as this for the condition of prostitution, I would at first seek to resolve inner, internal and external conflicts, focusing on her childhood relationship, and that to her parents. Don't need to worry about all that now, Freud, Tito exclaimed. She's dead. And then continued to explain to the exasperated gathering, silent before him, that, concerning the milk, sugar and coffee debate yesterday, I believe that economic self-sufficiency is what a nation requires most. Any dominant member of an empire will always seek to make its lesser members contribute more of the fair share to the greater nation among them. That seems logical, doesn't it? Yes, terror as a weapon must end. We all need to find a new way, a different kind of approach. What do you think, Stalin? Dead? What do you mean, dead? Stalin's dismissive retort. Dead, yes, quite dead, I'm afraid. Tito revealed as he explained the circumstances of such as, yes, in June her neck was broken. She'd gone to visit her husband in debtor's prison and... And? And what? Freud insisted to know more. Ever infuriated by yet another quite unnecessary aside pause in the dialogue between them. And, well, and indeed, he'd lost everything now, hadn't he? Tito started to publicly evaluate the poor man's life, and the family's name and honour was a step too far for him. Even from within the pitiful conditions he found himself in, his reputation would save him upon settling his later debts. Well, at least he had the hope of a fresh start. But now, who would touch him? All hope had been taken away from him by his wife's treacherous act. He lunged forward, arms stretched out from the void of his cell bars, and snapped her neck. Such was his rage. Instantly it was. Dead. Yes, there was no doubt about it. Tito then informed that as a result of this heinous violent act, June had been the month in which he was sentenced to death by hanging. It's the snail, snarled Hitler. You can't trust them. They move around with their homes on their backs, like a horse and cart, transients, gypsies, all of them. Hitler became ever more increasingly obsessed with his snail theory. He needs to find that snail and deal with it. That's what I'd do. Stalin, not quite convinced if Hitler was joking or not, used his previous phrase with perfect comedic timing. So, we're back to milk, sugar and coffee again then, are we, Hitler? One snail, one problem. No snail, no problem. Even Freud found time to laugh uncontrollably at the refined comment, now presented in a humorous fashion, one that had caused some degree of reflection and concern to him previously. Freud added, An apology is needed, I feel. After all, if all this started as a result of a mere flick of the toe, one dreads to think what would have happened to this poor blighter had he chosen to stamp on it instead. I'd apologise. That's what I'd do. Sorry, snail, he concluded. Can this desperate man's plight get any worse, Tito? Trotsky asked. Surely not. Please say no. And without further ado, Tito continued to deliver his sad narrative. Yes, it now worsens for him. His circumstance does not improve. For in July, he was told that his children, desperately poor, unwashed, unfed and unclothed, now on the street, uneducated among the squalor of the city. They were then sent to the workhouse by the old backstabbing friend. His interests were in the loins of the fairer sex, not of the children. He wiped his hands of it all. Hitler continued to insist on a snail conspiracy, becoming more and more convinced of a cult of insects who worked covertly to undermine the wealth of the state. Freud, on the other hand, had spoken in depth about madness, 
testifying that certain conditions had provoked this man to violent act, and as such, insanity surely made him do it. He could not surely be held accountable for his actions and be executed at the end of a long rope atop a very big drop. You've hit the snail on the head. There, Sigmund, old chap. Tito joked as he explained the nail-to-snail pun was merely a Freudian sip, again explaining the slip-sip part due to their presence in the coffee house. Jokes don't work if you have to explain them. Surely you know this, Tito, Trotsky informed and concluded. Anyway, do you really think that this venture is appropriate, a time for joking? You're right, Trotsky. It's all very sad, isn't it? I'll resist and do apologise. Now, where were we? It's August now, I believe, said Freud. Ah, yes, August. Well, in August. And then suddenly stopped and started to tap his fingers upon the tabletop. I love playing the piano, he informed. Just freeing up my joints a little, if you don't mind, gentlemen. Too much typing last night, I fear. Never leave Croatia without my typewriter. Never know when one will need to knock up a one sheet for the revolution, he ended. He was keen to ease his joints and later explained that he was meeting a friend across town where the two would play a piano duet together. If you don't get to August soon, I'll have you shot in the bloody street in front of your damn typewriter, Stalin yelled. Shot, Stalin, shot? That's not very democratic of you, is it? You're starting to sound like a fascist. That's the problem with the nationalist mindset. They don't see the need for alternate opinion. But then again, I suppose there is no need for a multi-party democratic platform state, as the Communist Party represents all the workers, doesn't it? Though, after saying this, Tito did impart further on the key facts concerning August. The whole trial had been based on the notion of his insanity. You are correct, Freud and he had suffered a total catastrophic collapse of the mind. And, Adolf, you too are correct to some degree, as much discussion concerning the apparent curse of the snail was put forward to the judge by the man's defence team, Tito explained. Some good news at last, then, Tito, said Trotsky. He didn't get hung after all, Freud interjected. Well, it's bloody obvious to me that he didn't get hung. Had he been so, he would never have lived to tell Tito the tale, would he? Ah, oh, missed that point completely, nutted Stalin. Yes, so it must finally be good news then, Tito. Not exactly good news, Tito continued. He still had no money. His defence team consisted of his brother, a local bookshop owner, a clever man, yes, but no experience of the legal system, especially the defence skills needed to defend a man from the crack of the noose. The insane defence all backfired, hoping to be freed. He was not and found that in August he was sent to the asylum for life. Tito then drifted off topic again. Live and let live, I say. I'm not above a deal with the devil. What do you think about freedom of the press, gentlemen, and of free movement too? I'm all in favour myself. Should war break out, I'd like to see an independent Yugoslavia free of its ethnic conflicts. I understand the nationalist debate, but once it starts it cannot be stopped, can it? Where does all that division end? September, Tito, September, please. Can we finish the blasted story? Stalin again snarled. Interestingly, Freud's journal later noted that the story had in fact taken over three hours to deliver at this point of dialogue, a frustration that I sense that you too, as readers, now share in. I was going to say that we make our own history, and I wanted to discuss the need to overthrow the monarchy. But given such tense mood of yours, Stalin, I will hurry, just for you. Tito had become aware of the lack of patience now with him and decided that if the story was ever going to be finally concluded, time was now of the essence. September arrived and Tito informed how the man had found out that his oldest son had died of consumption whilst in the workhouse that month. October informed him that his second youngest, also a son, was also now critically inflicted with the same dreadful, fatal condition. And in November, the poor, helpless fellow, now confined for life through his insanity, heard of a devastating rumour passed on from his brother. It was a credible one. His brother had told him during a brief, fleeting visit to the asylum that his youngest, his only daughter, a precious, beautiful young girl, was to be sold as an apprentice to Mrs Vine a notorious brothel owner who, without any doubt in what was left of his fragile mind, had notorious intent for her. Mrs Vine would often recruit from the workhouse by means of a subtle backhander 
that settled the outstanding financial accounts of her purchase's siblings and also paid for the silence of the workers. The room was silent. All of the men, and after quite a degree of pause, reached for the coffee jug simultaneously. None had any idea of what to say. It was the worst tragic story that they had ever heard. Pouring coffee would at least break attention from them. What was there to say but nothing? They were all crushed by this bitter revelation and the cruelty of life's blow inflicted upon this unknown man. Gentlemen, I see that you are quite distressed. Do you wish me to continue into December? Or shall we call it a day there? Tito said as a means merely to break this uncomfortable tale. In all honesty, I'm not sure I can hear any more, Trotsky, almost whispering, had said. I have nothing to say other than that. He looked down into his coffee cup and blessed the life he had led so far, stirring it all around and around in contemplation. I have not witnessed such tragedy and distress since 1905, when the Cossacks stormed the lines of demonstrated and butchered the people with swords, added Stalin. I'm not sure that Mrs. Vine is such a bad person, noted Hitler. After all, the girl would now be saved from the fate of consumption, wouldn't she? His views on women as mere procreators, and his need born of local reputation for frequent paid comfort of the younger girl, surely impacting on his inappropriate, misguided words. Freud summed up. I fear what we hear for December will be the worst revelation of all, and I'm not sure that I have now the psychological stamina to absorb the full impact of it, but I sense that you will impart that it is the brother who told you of this tragic story. After all is said, how would you have come to know of it? Yes, the brother tells you, doesn't he? And this poor, desperate fellow is himself found deceased. Perhaps he found some peace in the end, and... Tito interrupted Freud at this point, speaking in a newly found, kind, softened tone, as if reading a bedtime fairy story to a child, a manner of which to ease the men's discomfort as he now finished the story off finally putting to sleep a most grotesque tale of human suffering, throwing it to the past where it now belonged. Do not try to overanalyse the outcome, my friend. I will explain, he said. Yes, the brother did become involved, but he was not the one who told me the tale. For In December, the brother hatched a plan to break his kin out from the confines of the asylum. He had raised enough money to slip the guards, just enough to provide freedom and silence. In December, his brother was free, on the run, homeless and hungry. If only I could return to the old family home and just collect enough to sell, I could pay for the treatment of my son and for the return of my daughter, he had concluded. We could flee together, abroad, a new start. He knew that the risk of being caught was considerable, for he would soon be recognised amongst the neighbourhood of his former street and abode, and thus return to the asylum with short swift. But what was his freedom worth? its true value beyond the happiness of family. Tito then paused to sip slowly from his coffee cup. I need to know, demanded Freud. Is it a happy ending? Does he succeed? Does he get caught? Tell me, Tito. Tell us all, please. And accordingly, Tito obliged. He explained that he had waited for the cover of darkness before creeping away from the protection and security of his brother's bookshop, where he had hidden in the cellar below the entrance to which and steps down below, hidden from public view by an old wooden bookcase pushed across. The brother had collected the worst of all unsellable literature he possessed and placed it upon the shelves, knowing that customers would now not bother to pay attention or scrutiny to it. It was true to say that his hideaway would never have been found, though, against his brother's advice, he felt he could not remain there. He arrived at his former home late in the evening, about 11.30. It was on the following Christmas Eve, a year to the day that all of this tragedy had started. He thought about the previous year's encounter with the snail as he brushed aside the ash from the fire that had raised most of the house to the ground. He dug through the filth and debris looking for anything he could sell, but all was gone. What hadn't been destroyed by fire had by now been looted. There was nothing of value to be found. Tito informed them all as they silently awaited the final outcome, and as the perfect storyteller, he continued to deliver to their audience. He sat down in the earth, sobbing, a broken man. He took a glance at the pocket watch his brother had lent him. It was almost midnight. 
Within seconds, it would be Christmas Day. He thought back to the days of his former life and happiness, but he could not find any joy now. At the very pinnacle of human anguish and of despair, he... He what? asked Hitler. He killed himself, didn't he? That's what I'd have done. Hitler had interrupted again, most inappropriately, and as if lacking in the very basics of human compassion. No, returned Tito. He was indeed contemplating such an act, but was broken from his moment of despair by a strange feeling that suddenly came over him. Somehow, unable to end his own sad, bitter life, he had felt an overwhelming sense of purpose, born in his suffering, that he must live to spend his entire life of his sufferings, for his sins, for kicking the snail, you see. That's what he thought. An act that had doomed him to his pathetic, lonely existence. Yes, he became redemptive and sorrowful for what he had done the former year. He knelt down upon his knees and began to pray for the first time in his life. Oh yeah, that's right, God'll save him. What God? Trotsky declared. It was Freud's interpretation that this aesthetic remark was directed at Stalin, who had, of course, trained previously as a priest. The God issue was always a problem between the two men, and Trotsky would often dig at Stalin's vulnerability on this point. While Stalin pretended to non-believe these days, for the party's benefit, he would often creep off to attend a secret, but obviously not so secret, religious mass. Tito summed up what happened next by saying that at exactly midnight, 12 months to the day, 12 months to the precise very second, and as his watch struck exactly the stroke of midnight as Christmas Day arrived, he heard a knock at the door. And? asked Freud. And? asked Trotsky. And? asked Stalin. And? asked Hitler. All in turn, and one by one raising their heads above and moving upper bodies forward closer into the centre of the table toward Tito, as if a set of nodding dogs on a car window's back parcel shelf. And, replied Tito, to his now most attentive cohort, well, he had assumed his presence had been discovered. He gave in. Emotionally, psychologically, he answered the door, expecting to be arrested and returned to the dire conditions of the asylum, locked away for the rest of his life suffering for his sins, as he had now resolved himself to do. But there was no one there, not a person or cat or fox in sight. The streets were completely deserted. He looked down, and there it was. He saw the snail. The very same snail had returned at exactly a year to the day, at midnight of Christmas Eve to the very second. The man looked down at the little, helpless creature. The snail raised its head and in extending its fragile eyes at the end of its tender tentacles upwards and outward towards him, and in a soft, pathetic voice, squeaky little voice which was not one as expected of a great prophetical revelation, it said, What did you do that for? Of all those present, Sigmund Freud would later write, it was the man we would come to know as Marshal Josef Broth Tito, who revealed himself to be the master manipulator. <laughs>